Welcome to the Star of Grind. So, uh, without much ado, let me introduce you guys to Ankur. He's um, the regional head for Groupon. He looks after four countries India, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand. And uh, before that, he worked for Rocket Investments, where he was a venture partner. So he helped with Jabong.com and I think Groupon as well. And then, even before that, he was a co-founder with Accenture Web, where these guys produce these awesome websites, Gari.com, Sikinshadi.com, Taza.com, StudyNation.com, and then there are a few more. And then before that, he was a consultant with A.T. Kearney as well. He's an ISB grad. <laughs> And then he's an MS in physics as well from Michigan University. And he's only like 33 or 32 or something like that. 33. So is there anything left for you to... So anyway, sir, please, <laughs> please uh, Thank welcome... You. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should I uh, sit yeah, there? Yeah. Great. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Though I, I come here every week, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I actually failed to mention that he's also a teacher. So. I was, you know, my, while I was doing my research, I just thought, you know, is there anything left for you to do? Lots. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, uh, my, my financial, I stay in Faridabad, and uh, my, my financial goal is to own a house in Delhi, which is getting harder and harder for me to do. <laughs> it's, it's, so I've given up on that. So now it's all spiritual, right? right. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, the way we start is, uh, you know, we would like to know you. So the first question we generally ask, you know, where did you grow up? Something about your family, uh, your siblings, your school, stuff like that. Sure. So I uh, I come from Kashmir, which is the northern part of uh, of India. Uh, for the three of you, uh, everyone else would perhaps know. <laughs> and uh, but I've I've stayed all my life in Delhi. I've, I grew up uh, here. I wasn't born here. I was born in Amritsar, uh, but I've grown up here. I went to Delhi University for my bachelor's. Uh, did physics at Hindu College, and uh, had a ball of a time. And then I, back then my, my, my role models were Fox Mulder and Dana Scully of X-Files. I wanted to become a NASA scientist. I wanted to be the first man on Mars. Uh, and all of that led me to the US where I did my masters in physics uh, with the hope of getting a PhD, finally becoming a professor, going to NASA and all that. But then I realized that uh, NASA only takes people who are American citizens, so I'll have to give up my Indian citizenship. I said, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, no. So let Shah Rukh Khan become the NASA scientist <laughs> in a movie. Um, I, uh, I realized after my master's I didn't want to continue, so I, I worked in the US for a year in the university itself. Uh, so it, I wouldn't call it professional working in any circumstance. It's a very protected environment, as you can imagine. Uh, I was writing research papers for magazines trying to predict the age of the Milky Way and all that. So it was just very nice. School stuff when I spoke to girls. Uh, so I, 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 was, I, was, I was becoming an astrophysicist and uh, almost 50% of the girls used to extend their hand. I said, no, I didn't mean an astrologist. I meant an astrophysicist. <laughs> so uh, it was fun. And, um, and then I decided to come back. I always wanted to come back to India. There was so much happening back then. This is 2002. Um, right after the dot-com bubble, so uh, the U.S. was going through its pangs. India was suddenly the, the shining star. This was the India shining campaign uh, all that time. And um, I came back, but uh, I was a guy with a master's in physics um, with nothing else. And virtually everyone said, you know, there's, there's no hope in hell for you yeah. in India. You, you you're not going be, anywhere. You need right? to be so, an engineer in India. Yeah, yeah exactly, right? <laughs> uh, or, or maybe not even that anymore. Yeah. Right? So uh, you, you just, uh, you need to. So I said, okay, so what happens? I said, you need to do something called an MBA. I said, what's that? I said, it just, it's a business degree. It will get you nice jobs and all that. So I said, okay. Uh, and then I looked around and I said, um, all, all the MBA were, were two years. And I said, no, that's just too much investment for something I don't even know about. Uh, and back then, uh, ISB had just started. It had been three years uh, for the Indian School of Business. Uh, I loved the concept. It seemed to be extremely in the face of a lot of people, just completely destroyed a lot of notions that business education was about. So I decided to apply there. In fact, I applied while I was at the US, and I got through, but I couldn't make it because uh, I had some submissions. So I, I was a diligent student back then. So I gave up on my MBA education because I had to create a deadline or reach a deadline. So I applied again. I got through, thankfully. And I went to the ISP, 
but before that I got a year of uh, professional, my first professional experience at a small company called uh, NIS Sparta, which uh, had just been acquired by Reliance, so it was a completely different environment for me from university. Right, no longer small anymore. Yeah, yeah. well, um, so then I went to ISB, I did a year there, and I completely, absolutely loved that experience. It completely changed the way I thought about things, um, exposed me to a lot more, and um, that was when I also decided that I want to be a consultant because that was what I was doing so at NIS. So uh, the entrepreneur genes haven't been awakened by then? So entrepreneurial streaks were there, no? if I may mm -hmm. uh, be a little uh, non-humble. So I, I remember my, my first entrepreneurial venture was selling trump cards. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys uh, know, you guys are not from the WWF era, you know, or some of you may have seen that, yeah? Exactly, some, some of you, yeah. So great, uh, no, I, I, I never got that concept. I never understood what people get out of it. But there was this time, and maybe there still is, there was this time when every kid growing up was just crazy about WWF. You know, the Undertaker or Yokozuna or you know, <laughs> some names like that, yeah. And there was this, this frail guy, Joe123 or some, some kid. One. And there were these trump cards uh, that you used to play with. So they had just launched, and um, there was this, uh, and they were spreading out wild. And along with the trump cards, these guys who were making them, they started making stickers of these WWF stars that you could post on your pencil box, your you know, cupboards, something like okay. that. So um, I bought one of them, uh, not knowing what to do with it. I just thought it was you know, cool stickers, etc. And then I was in my school bus, and this guy said, uh, hey, these are cool. How much are these for? I said, five rupees, because that's what I bought them for. Uh, and they were, there were 20 of them. So, uh, He's like, okay, give me all 20. Uh, I says, yeah, okay. And uh, then I gave him, he gave me a 100 rupee note. And I had meant five rupee for the sheet. He thought five rupee for sticker. I was like, that's it. <laughs> that is my first venture. And I did that for the whole of two days before someone figured out. I says, uh, I found these at five rupees in the market the other day. <laughs> that's when I stopped doing it. Um, and the other time, this is almost illegal, is uh, not, not this one, the one I'm going to share is uh, when I was in the US, and I've, uh, I'm active on this website called Cora. It's a fascinating website. You all should be part of it. It's just beautiful. Um, and I've written about this. Uh, I could go to jail. So um, what had happened is uh, my first summer uh, in the US when I came back to India, I had to for some work. I, before I came back, went to Amazon, and uh, science books are extremely expensive in the US, uh, upwards of $100, $150, so on and so forth. They're not so much in India because they're Asian editions. Plus, so, you can uh, always photocopy. Yeah, well, well, yeah. well, photocopying is not an acceptable art in yeah. the US, <laughs> right, uh, right. As, as is in DU. So uh, I draw, drew a list of the top 10 sellers, uh, Resnick Halliday's, and all those really physics heavy duty books. Uh, and I came to India. I went to Naisarak, which is in Chandni Chowk, and I bought all those books full of a suitcase. Uh, okay. And then I relisted them as second-hand books on eBay. Uh, and I, in the US when I went back, and I made some $1,200 in a day. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> and I bought my first laptop through that. So uh, that's what I did. I am very sure it's illegal. but uh, but. When I wrote that in Quora, there were all, all these guys, oh, you know, it's illegal, etc. How could you be, you know, like the CEO of this publicly listed company and openly declare it, etc. And then someone came to my rescue. So in the US, there was a law passed that this is acceptable. Uh, right. and, and this can happen, yes. So uh, only in second hand, not in primary. So you can't sell it at the retail price. Uh, but a book retailing for 150 I sold them for $35. I bought them for like 10 um, That was That was it. So... I knew I wanted to become an entrepreneur, long story short. Uh, I just don't know when, and I didn't know what. So ISB kind of gave you the path or yes. gave you the vision? I think it gave me the confidence. Um, it gave me the confidence that it didn't matter if I failed, because I could always go back to what I was doing, and this pedigree or this network that I had built would support me there. Right. So, you know, I, you know, I actually wanted to ask you this question because you're such a big supporter of MBA and I, I've gone through your blog as well. You're very passionate about ISB, by the way. So, you know, the guys like Guy Kawasaki, Vivek Vadwa, these guys are like MBA bashers. They say entrepreneurs, no MBA. Yeah. What's, what's your take on this? I think it's, it's the timing in, in your life. If you, are, if you already know that you want to be an entrepreneur and you already are, an MBA is a waste of time. 
Definitely would be because you are you're better. And I know so I'm on the ISB admissions panel. And I interview guys, and there are these kids who are um, I shouldn't say kids, but they're these smart guys who are who, who are running companies, and they want to leave that and come to ISB. And my first question is: ISB is worth 25 watt lakhs now, extremely expensive. What if I gave you this 25 to put it back into your business? Would you much rather do that or come to an MBA education? And they almost always say, I would still do the education. And um, at least for me, that doesn't cut the slack. Because that's not what a true entrepreneur would be. However, in my case, or several others, where you haven't yet become an entrepreneur, maybe you don't know what. And in my case, I was like, uh, I was a physics guy. I didn't even know anything about business. Uh, MBA worked for me a lot. I'd imagine there are a lot of people for whom MBA would just not work. Right. And this is exactly the place where you met your uh, co-founders as well, yes. Umang and uh, Vivek. Yes. Uh, so Umang and Vivek, uh, who I started my first company with, they were my uh, batchmates. Vivek was my, uh, we don't share rooms at ISB, but we share uh, apartments. He was in Michigan as well. He was in Michigan as well. But he was in University of Michigan, I was in Michigan State. Uh, we, we, we fight. We, we're, not, we, we're not friendly. So uh, that's where we met. And uh, it, was, it was all by coincidence. I remember uh, Vivek and I, along with two other friends, were, were just meeting one fine evening. And he said, I'm working on this idea called secondshadi.com. I said, what's that? And I said, it's a matrimonial site for divorcees and widowed people. Now, can you imagine how many marriages get, you know, take place in India? Of course, some bit of it would be getting divorced and, of course, widowed as well. They don't have any avenue uh, as, as organized as a matrimonial site. I said, I love it. Uh, he says, would you want to help me on that? I said, sure, why not? Oh, tell me what you want. Yeah. And that's how we got started. Yeah, so before I, we jump to that, yeah. I want to take you back to AT Kearney. Yeah, sure. So ISB to AT Kearney. Yep. I, I guess everyone in ISB wants to become a consultant. Yes. So you pretty much had the same idea. Yes. So AT Kearney, yeah. so ISB to AT Kearney. Yes, that, that was a conscious choice. Um, I, I honestly, when I joined ISB, I only knew of McKinsey and BCG as management companies. And uh, nothing else was uh, these Adikani's, Boos, Baines, and uh, I don't know, they're just uh, you know, random names. So, but w once I entered ISB, I realized all that I was sure of, I want to get into management consulting because that's who I am by, by just personality. I cannot be doing one thing at a time. Uh, that I feel is the worst use of my time. So I have to be doing multiple things, and consulting was perhaps the best thing. You know, multiple projects, different clients, thrown into different situations, yeah. ambiguity. Thankfully, it worked out. So, you know, you must have learned a lot. So that kind of, you know, paved your yes. way to become uh, the entrepreneur that you are. Yes, absolutely. So two things that AT Kani, so I was in AT Kani for three years. And what it gave me was, uh, if you have friends who are management consultants or you are yourself, uh, one thing that gets spoken about is it gives you structure <clears throat> in thought. So uh, when you look at management consulting presentations, they're all about matrices, two into two, all about process flow, diagrams, et cetera, et cetera. All that is fancy, but it's all about structure. You're, you're breaking down a problem into smaller problems, and you're figuring out how to solve them one by one by one. Uh, and that really, really helped me uh, in being an entrepreneur, or, or at least attempting to be one. So, you know, I could, all my management friends that I've known, they say that it's, uh, it's like an ADR job, <laughs> and you managed to work on Extension Web part-time with AT Kearney. Yes. So did you ever sleep or? I, uh, no, I, I did manage to, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, so, so, so the structure was, I actually first went to AT Kani when this idea came about, and I sought their permission. And uh, I said, I, I want to do this. Uh, it will not come at the expense of uh, my work, and you have to be cautious of that, and uh, keep judging me on that as well. And they said, it's fine. So the agreement was, um, I would work definitely for five days a week on AT Kani. And whatever time I get, which is my personal time, I would put it into the startup. But that wouldn't come at the expense of AT Kani. So okay. for a year and a half, I was working five days on Kani and two days on Accentium. Okay, but that's actually pretty nice of uh, uh, AT Kani. They were, yeah. And it, I'd imagine that almost everyone will say the same. Maybe people don't approach them. They are the oh, we startup and we make we make enough money, and uh, then we'll one day say. F off, and I don't need you guys. So, uh, so Delhi, mein toh, everyone is a, is a real estate uh, entrepreneur. Yeah, so you, exactly. You, everyone in my office, you know, buying flats and selling Absolutely. them off and making... Absolutely. Uh, for, for that one day when they will have the balls to <laughs> put in their resignation letter without asking for it. Yeah. But... So, <laughs> so Extension Web uh, was started by Vivek. Yes. 
so uh, you know b- before that vivek kind of had this website uh, desi, desi martini Martin, yes so what i wanted to check with you was, was that the uh, you know once he sold that off was that the amount uh, you know the money that came from desi martini was used as no actually stuff? not uh, so desi martini uh, which vivek ran who was uh, who's the ceo of accentium and the founder uh, that was his personal gain so uh, that that never came through so accentium was started by complete personal funds um, a large part of it coming from vivek's dad who was like the de facto investor um and then <clears throat> our personal funds as well we never raised money we still haven't ever raised money in fact i've n- never raised money in my life which is kind of a, a, a taboo i've never seen a term sheet in my life ever which right. was different from manish which was sitting here <laughs> two yeah, weeks he back maybe si- <laughs> signs one every every day or yeah, something exactly. like that yeah exactly <laughs> so i've never seen a term sheet in my life i don't know what it means <laughs> okay interesting but yeah Right. So uh, you know how so I mean with your own funds but how did you manage to scale up because I think you had this uh, product plus services kind of a model yes. so was that right at the beginning or so uh, our first our first website was second shadi uh, and that was an extremely profitable venture very low investment extremely high margins so we we turned profitable within 3 months and we recovered all the money that we had eventually sent in in 6 So from six months onwards, it was it was like this nice cash flow that was pumping in, and and we were using this money to pay off the salaries and build other products. And what we did nice was we built a development team that was shared. So that development team, as soon as they built one product, were just building the next, and then the next, and then the next. And we had the call center that was almost shared. We had salespeople who were somewhat distinct, so on and so forth. So we used a lot of shared services concept to quickly build these websites, six of them in all, um, and that helped. So you, I mean, all three of you, you guys are actually technology guys, or you were all business guys. Um, Vivek's the only. Well, Vivek's the technology guy and the front face. Umang is also a computer science engineer. Um, I, um, I don't know computer science. You're the Excel guy. I, I'm an Excel guy. Yes. So uh, <laughs> I, yeah. If someone asked me, can you code? I said in Excel, and says yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, uh, for startups. Uh, is it always the product that helps or it's good to have something in services as well you know to get the cash flowing coming in uh it depends on what market you're catering um for instance a matrimonial website is a very uh, it's a very non sales environment right because uh, you, you don't really need to push uh, people would buy on their own we had structured the pricing in such a mechanism that it it, it actually worked really well so we were the first matrimonial site in india to launch a payment mechanism based on contacts rather than time so we said you pay this much to connect with these many people uh and we made it in such a way that it was uh, it was so we had three packages just to give you a bit of a detail we had we had a package at 999 which allowed you to connect to 10 people so you could view the profile of anyone you could send in a hi to anyone but that was all about it uh if you needed to really have a conversation get contact details etc you needed to pay this amount something like linkedin premium exactly yeah. right so it was triple line for 10 one triple line for 20 and two triple line for unlimited and then suddenly what happened is everyone went for the two triple line because it, one it's it's second marriage right so so you're a bit more cautious you want to explore in, enough opportunities etc first marriage no you, you're just too excited now so you'll <laughs> <laughs> you'll just possibly settle for the first one right uh, that's it uh, but second marriage is you'll take your time etc and and we also did that math so we we found that the time period from when a person created a profile to the time that they found a match was 9 months uh, which is a fairly long time uh, but that's perhaps true for second marriages not so much for first so we structured it that way and it helped um and then we have that call center which was the services so, you know to, just to help make sure that they can find uh, everything but <clears throat> that was a completely automated product um it's it's the it's the best you can get to building your own business so you don't require anything except for two people who are attending calls and three people who build the website that's it but the others that we built so gadi.com was the second one it was a complete absolute sales model uh, there was there was nothing trivial about that business because we built the website we had so we started with used cars and we said uh, let's create a marketplace of used cars there's so many used cars being sold and bought every day in india let's create a marketplace let's make it easier so um we thought that most of the volume will come in from individual buyers like you and i who had cars to either buy and sell but no that wasn't the case most of the volume in india was driven by car dealers 
who were buying and selling, almost trading in cars, because they knew that the, the market for used cars was massive. The supply is limited, because in India, typically you start selling cars when it's five to seven years old. And five to seven years back, uh, in 2006, so that means 2001, there were hardly any car models in India. There were only the Marutis and the Fiat's and so on and so forth. It completely exploded in 2003, 2004. So there was limited supply, but there were enough people who wanted cars. And that mismatch was completely exploited by dealers. But dealers were also not online. They didn't care. So if we went to a dealer and said, we'll give you a good um, interface, we'll get you to you know, upload photographs, write in the specs, and it says, you like, what are you Right, so, con karega ye, right? so it, it just didn't work. So it was an absolute hands down thing where we had to literally help them build the business, get the listing in place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and it wasn't easy at all. But that's the way we scaled it. So you know, I mean, you came out with so many products. How did you conceptualize? I mean, were you like researching, or you had a team working for you to figure out, you know, these areas, these areas? No, we, we we had three very expensive MBAs <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> as founders. <laughs> no, they they better do their job. No, so we didn't hire any research analyst or consulting firm. No, our 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 understanding or the way we thought about it was very simple. So we were in the advertising space. All that we did is we looked at the print media and looked at the biggest categories of print. And we said, there has to be a time and place when this migrates to online. It's eventuality that can never go off. Cars, yes. Real estate, yes. Education, yes. These are the three biggest categories and matrimonial. All these four are the bread earners for a print company, a Times of India or a Hindustan Times. That's where they get their money from. We said, let's build that. That's it. That's all that we need to do. Just build that. We didn't do real estate because it's extremely hard and it's a very, very hard market to crack. But everything else, um, education and cars and matrimonial, we did. Matrimonial, we didn't get into primary matrimonial because they were already shadi.coms and yeah. it was too messy already. That was it. There wasn't, you know, as, as a lot of you may think, before you start, you do all these Excel numbers and sheets and validations, et cetera, et cetera. Honestly, when I go back and perhaps even today, it just got, you know, it's, it's do epic shit. That's it. No, that's that's your that's your driver, and that, that's what you go right. with. Right. So you know uh, this. This is I had this thought from Manish's converse, conversation as well. You know, you're just giving us a fairy tale kind of a, a story. So I'm, you must have failed sometimes in Accenture. You must have thought, okay, yeah, let's go back back to AT Kearney. So uh, no, thankfully that didn't happen. I'm extremely lucky to to say that. But uh, what I would go back to is. Most of the decisions that I've taken in life have been seemingly very risky. So leaving the US, 100% uh, scholarship, the best university for what you're doing, the life, the works, blah, blah, blah. And I says, leave it, come back. What you're going to do, I don't know. Right? And everyone in my world said, you are a fool. Right? Do you, if my parents had enough money, they would say, we will not give you any of our wealth. <laughs> anymore, right? uh, and, and that's it. Right? They would never make me an inheritance or, or whatever it is. So that was one. And um, to, to a lot of people, that decision itself will not be easy. And uh, I don't know what worked for me, and, uh, but I, this is how I operate. For, for me, this is, it wasn't a hard decision because that was the only thing that I could have done. There was nothing else. Uh, the same was uh, joining ISB. So when I joined ISB, I had all of 14,000 rupees in my bank account. That was it. That's the only money I had. And I went to SBI to apply for a loan of 14 lakhs. Um, my, my dad said, uh, there's no way that I can, if, if you, I am your guarantor, but that's just a signature. If anything happens, I have nothing to back that up. Uh, and I said, no, hopefully that wouldn't need to happen. But that itself, no, uh, and, I, and I'd got through IMs, I'd got through XLRI. Uh, at that time, they were like 5 lakhs, 6 lakhs, 8 lakhs, no, highly subsidized, etc. And ISB was still a name. It was in its fifth year. Um, people were still figuring out what it was, etc. And that was the second decision. But again, in my head, there wasn't any other, any other decision. And the third big one, well, actually, no. The, the, the third one was leaving Kani and joining Accentium. Um, management consulting. Stayed in five-star hotels for five days a week. Met all the people that we see on the magazines of India. 
I worked with them as a 25 year old, told them what they should do about their business, <laughs> and they agreed. Um, all that, and I says, no, I will go and build secondshadi.com. Well, and uh, took a massive pay cut. Uh, I got married that year. Uh, again, very risky decision. Everyone questioned. Everyone said no. Everyone said that's, et cetera, et cetera. And then also leaving accent, which I'm guessing you will come to, but yeah. 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 So um, it's, it wasn't a fairy tale. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really blessed to be where I am, and I think it's just pure luck. There's nothing else. I, I would want to credit myself for what I've done, but I think I can't. There are enough people who've worked harder than me, uh, and they still continue to, but uh, I'm just where I am because I was in the right time, right place. And right. Yeah, of course. So, you know, just sticking to Accentium and uh, on this topic on co-founders, so were you guys like, a, you know, equal percentage partners or uh, uh, Vivek uh, kind of hired you as a co-founder? No, so yeah, so, so since Vivek started, he was the, the majority guy and that was the understanding. We were all comfortable with that, especially because Second Shadi was his idea, Gadi was his idea. We were more of, excuse me, uh, execution co-founders, right? Just getting the thing off because he was just one guy and he couldn't do it. Um, so even all of Accentium, the six businesses, we were a total of 43 people. Uh, we were like the WhatsApp of that time, <laughs> though much smaller and with no money. But uh, uh, that's who we were. So we were running these, uh, you know, with just 43 people, we were running six businesses, making enough money, very profitable, uh, but not, of course, like crazy top lines and all that stuff. Uh, and that was the understanding that he would continue to. Plus, because uh, his dad's company had been the investor, okay. uh, by, by virtue of that, uh, he slash his dad's company owned majority of that company. Okay. So, you know, what's your advice on actually selecting co-founders? Because I think it's one of the most... Yes. So, you were kind of lucky because you had these friends from ISB and you had a chance to know these guys. Yes. But, you know, someone who's starting out and, yeah. you know, looking for co-founders, yeah. you know, what do you should look for? It's the hardest thing ever, honestly. It's, no, um, I think it's, for, for a true entrepreneur, I would imagine that it's harder than finding a marriage partner. Uh, and, and I'm not saying this because, no, it's, it's frivolous or anything, because you, the, the journey that you have once this thing kicks off is just so demanding, just so mind numbing that you would never have the time to really stop and say, is this working, is this not working? And the day that you realize that it's working, it's not working, you will say, oh shit, what just happened? And at that point of time, the breakout or whatever it is, it's just very, very, very hard. Uh, which is unlike marriage, right? Because it, it's, it's slow and steady, you know, you, you have all these days and times and blah, you go on a honeymoon, etc. There's no honeymoon in a startup. It, it's, it's, just, it's just work from day one. Now, um, and that, that's why I can imagine it's extremely hard. That's why I imagine forums like these are extremely important because that's where the valley cracked it. That's, no, the valley is valley not because there's money in there. The valley is valley because you can literally walk into a cafe you know, and go up and says, uh, not when you have a drink, and it says, want to start a company? <laughs> no, it, it's almost like that. No, it's, it's, it, the people don't date there. They find co-founders. No, that, that, that's what they do. And, uh, and that's what's fascinating. So it's hard. Um, I don't... I don't think there's any science behind it. There isn't. And there's no way of figuring it out that this would work till the time you get into it, which is the scarier part because you're literally betting your idea exactly. on something that you wouldn't know whether it works or not. So, you know, it, is it just good to have a single promoter and then kind of hire uh, co-founders, you know, offer them maybe some, some amount of equity and then uh, at least you have this leverage that you, if it's not working out, you can at least fire so, them or... Uh, I, I, I'll answer this question differently. I think the biggest mistake that people make when they are finding co-founders is they find friends. Uh, and that's never a good idea. That isn't. So the reason why Vivek and I worked was because, not that he was a friend or that he, you know, we stayed together at ISB, is because he could do what I couldn't do and I could do what he couldn't do. So he's, uh, he, he's, he's, the, he's a development guy. He's a techie. He can build this stuff, which I cannot. I learned it and it was very hard for me because it didn't come naturally. But for him, sales and marketing, uh, it doesn't come naturally. He's not a very you know, extrovert person. He, you know, he, he can't go and close deals, for instance. 
uh, deals in the sense not not Groupon deals, but just deals, right? Uh, <laughs> he, he can't uh, he, he he can't go ahead and and have sales conversations or anything like that. Uh, and that's where it, it beautifully worked for us. Uh, that's what you have to look for in a co-founder. So most people would say, I'm not a techie. I need to find a technology partner. And that guy could be your co-founder. And there's nothing wrong with it. And he could come whenever you have the need for it, rather than beginning, as you were suggesting, right from the start. No, that isn't important. It isn't. Um, but trying to do it all by yourself um, is extremely hard. I can imagine you would, if you could be the Superman and do it, but you will always have these buckloads of doubt of whether I'm doing it right or not, and never have really the bouncing board that you want, which will be your co-founder. That's critical. So three years at Accenture Web, and you decided to move on. Yes. Rocket Investments. Yes. How did that happen? So, uh, so the reason why I moved out of Accentium, uh, again, that was uh, what people, again, classify as a risky decision. Um, everything was going fine. Uh, we were now being spoken about, talked about, things were looking good. And suddenly I said, you know what, it's, it's, it's done. And the biggest driver of that was I realized that the, way, the business model of Accentium was advertising. And that could never be a really big scalable business in India. <clears throat> there are only a couple of companies that you can think of, maybe Rediff, maybe India Times. Uh, which have really got to that scale, even Yahoo struggles, whatever it does, etc. And they are massive. So if you were to build a media company um, purely on advertising, there's only so much that you can go to. And that's where I, I thought, no, I want to do more. Uh, I want to experience the next scale. I want to get 10x uh, and not be limited there. And I took a conscious choice and said, let's, let's split. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what happened. When I quit, I didn't have any idea. Again, um, it's, it's, uh, it's like this, uh, it's a wrong attitude to have, I think. You know? it's, it's, it's like uh, I have a family, I have people to support, and like, well, I'm like this Banjara, so I don't care, you know, let's, let's go. So didn't uh, Vivek and Uman kind of talk, talk to you out of it? Uh, well, uh, there were several things that were happening around that time. So the Gadi exit was happening. Uh, we sold Gadi to the IBO group. Uh, and at that point of time, there was a, a, a chance for me to also monetize my, uh, my share. Uh, and that was like the, the, the commercial part of it. I said, okay, no, why not? If, if all these things are putting in line. And the departure happened that Umang went on to lead Gadi, and he's the CEO of Gadi right now under the IBO banner. I exited Accentium, and Vivek still runs Accentium for Second Shadi and Taza, which are the two main brands. Um, and I didn't have any idea. The only idea I had, had was, um, uh, an idea which I, I think has still potential. I wanted to open up a ch chain of dessert parlors in India. Um, yeah, we, I think we woefully need that. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I, there's, there's hardly any option. Yeah, exactly. No, if, if I, if I want to have some desserts after food, there is no place to go except yeah. for those coffee shops where well, the Bika same Bika walnut brownie, yeah. do you want it with ice cream, <laughs> without ice cream? And the same question and, and come on and, and all those. but. Uh, you'll see that bakeries are just flourishing, but no one has. So I wanted to replicate the, the dessert section of a five-star buffet. That was my idea. Small portions, multiple varieties. You go in, you pay for any five, no, whatever, any ten. Anyways, that, that's that. Um, but I wasn't from the retail background. And back then, uh, all the investors that I spoke to is like, you're an internet guy. Why do you want to do retail, et cetera, et cetera? So I don't have an answer. I'm just an entrepreneur. I can build this thing for you if you want to. Uh, no, but if you want pedigree, I, I don't have it. Uh, and so, eh, okay. so I said, OK, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll do it when I have enough money, or possibly I'll back someone up who, who wants to do it. Um, and that's when I was looking for what to do next. Um, and Rocket happened. And um, if, I, if I look at my life, I think most of it uh, have, how many of you have heard of this concept called the PayPal Mafia? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Elon Musk. It's a fantastic concept. You should read about it. So uh, we all know about PayPal. Uh, most success, not most, a lot of successful companies that you see today, especially in the internet, have come from the original team of PayPal. It's almost as if that company churned out the best possible entrepreneurs that our generation has ever seen. And it can't be by coincidence. It can't be that you know, they just gathered, a, they had an IQ test, and all of them, you know, they got together, all that. that. So it's because of the network. It's because your opportunities are built because of your network. Uh, and that's where, uh, that, that's the story of my life. There's nothing else that's, that's helped me. Um, 
Rocket Internet was a ISB job posting that came up. Okay. ISB has about 2,900 alums as of now, so about 2,600 back then. I was the only ISB and that applied to that role. I don't know why no one else read that. <laughs> you know, I don't know what happened. You know, I, I was the only one who applied for that. Uh, it was an unknown name, Rocket Internet. No one knew about it. Uh, they, the big fame that they had was the founders, which were the Samuel brothers, yeah. had sold something to eBay. That was the only fame to claim. Sorry, claim to fame uh, that they had. And uh, I said, sure. Um, and I met those guys. I met one of the brothers, Oliver Samuel, who is the awesomest guy on earth right now when it comes to internet business, while a lot of people would disagree because of his style and everything. But that guy just blew me off and says, I'm going to work with you because I'm going to learn so much from you. And he said, I'm setting up Rocket Internet in India, and you drive that for me. I said, sure, I will do that. What's your first business? And he says, I want to open up a fashion retailer online. <clears throat> I said, oops, FDI. So I said, I don't know, care, no, just figure it out. So we did that for three months. Um, from Jan of 2011 till March of 2011, we, had a, we hired a bunch of super experienced lawyers, business consultants, blah, 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 figuring out how we could get into this while still complying with the laws. And we concluded, not possible, without an Indian partner. And he didn't want an Indian partner. So he said, you know what, shut it down. So we shut it down. Uh, we had about 25 people that we had uh, hired, and we shut down. That was my first shutdown. You know, I, I, I sat cutting checks to the, to the landlord, to all those selling the laptops for scrap value, selling the mouse, you know, the wires, and all that stuff. I literally liquidated the company uh, overnight because he said, close it down. And then the next day, he called me. He said, have you heard of Groupon? I said, yeah, I've heard of Groupon. So I says, uh, we have bought a company, uh, which will be Groupon. Uh, yeah, no, so this was in India. We had already bought City Deal uh, last year in 2010. We bought a company in India called Sosasta.com, uh, and that will now be Groupon in India. Come join me there. Sure, why not? And that's it. That's, that's how it happened. So in April 2011, I joined Groupon. But I thought, uh, you know, the rocket investments were also involved in Jabong. Uh, so, so while we were at Jabong, so Jabong started in Jan of last year, 2012. I'm talking about Jan to March 2011. So what happened is in November 2011, Oli found the Indian partner. And he called me and said, would you want to now start it again? I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm busy with Groupon. I'm loving it, so, so don't disturb me. I said, OK, fine. I'll, I'll find someone else. And that's how Jabong started. So the, the two CEOs of Jabong, which are Arun and Praveen, were part of the team that we were working on when we originally were working on Jabong. And that's how Jabong happened. So Groupon, you first, OK, so before starting Groupon, I had a question. What exactly is Venture Partner? OK. so. Um, it's a, it's a fancy name. So, so the style of Rocket Internet, for those of you who don't, Rocket Internet picks up management consultants and investment bankers and calls them managing directors and places them into businesses in the country. So these are typically, like, I know of people who have been fired because they were too old. Right? So it's a company that hires people between 25 to 30 years of age, gives them super normal titles, uh, a, a lot of autonomy and snatches away their work-life balance. So I says, that's it, you're gone, and gives you a little bit of equity. Venture partner is basically the guy responsible for the business of Rocket Internet in that country. And at any point of time, they would have multiple venture partners. So we are responsible for generating ventures for Rocket Internet. OK. So first, you uh, started as a consultant for Groupon. Yes. And then you eventually kind of uh, joined there. Uh, so, so Oli, when he told me about Groupon, uh, I wasn't, uh, he said, just, just see what it is. Because it was an acquisition. So he thought that the management team is in place, everything is in place. He said, just go and help them up. Uh, because you know the, the scenario as, as much as they do. Just help them up. Um, and that's what I did for three months. And after three months, we realized that the acquisition wasn't a good acquisition. The management team wasn't very capable. Uh, and I relayed back to, to Oli and said, uh, I don't think this will work out the way you would imagine it to be. And he said, do you have anyone else in mind? I said, no, I don't. He says, OK, then it's you. So, and that was it. So he said, you drive Groupon now, and um, I'll fire those guys. You become the CEO. Uh, and uh, that's, that's how it happened. So in August 2011, 
Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I was made the country manager of Group One India. So how's, how's the Group One journey? It's uh... fascinating, uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, for two or three things. One is, it's a, uh, it's a type of e-commerce that is completely new to India. Um, when we entered, the likes of Snapdeal and all were already there, but they were not really executing what Groupon was executing globally. It was a very different model of a token price. You pay a certain amount, you pay the rest to the merchant. It was generating a very different kind of uh, customer mentality than what Groupon stood for. So um, it was completely creating, it's not about growing a company, it's about creating a category. Um, because the concept of daily deals or the concept of service e-commerce does not exist in India. <clears throat> and that's why it's fascinating because you're learning things every day. You, you, you're figuring out how people will react to buying meals online, buying spa packages online, buying health packages online, buying travel online, etc. Um, and that has been uh, absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, the second is uh, the scale. Um, this is exactly what I wanted to do in terms of scale. Uh, it's a, today, I'm, it, India is, is a 250 plus size team. Uh, and then we have Indonesia, Philippines and Thailand. So together I'm, I'm managing about 600 people strong, um, which is a fairly big portion of what the APAC business is in Groupon. That's exactly what I wanted from the experience. But at the same time, it comes in with a lot of autonomy. So I'm tied into a parent or a mothership called Groupon, um, but what I do on a daily basis is almost as much as I would do it for my own company. They're just the investors. So you know, Groupon, as I understand, they're, they're very good in terms of technology, especially if you talk about the deal uh, uh, sphere. So uh, you know, I hear that they hire uh, economists, uh, scientists, and people to analyze data. Is that right. is that really happening? To some extent, <laughs> uh, we so there are um, that happens a lot in the U.S. All their decisions are taken largely on data. What they're thinking of for the future is just mind-boggling. Uh, completely going to change the way people interact with the internet. That is yet to really transmit itself to the entire rest of the world. Um, so what you what you see, Groupon India, is perhaps what Groupon US was two years back. Um, it's a very, very um, underdeveloped version of what the Groupon US is. Um, and we, we are at the receiving end of those technology interventions as and when they happen. Uh, but the Groupon US model, what you're saying is right. So, you know, uh, again, going by news, Groupon has its share of uh, controversies as well. So uh, this is, again, you know, one of those cases where uh, the founder had to be fired uh, this uh, founder who happens to be the CEO, he was actually fired by the board. So, uh, and I think you were there at that time. Yes, uh, I was. So how, I mean. Uh, I had met him three weeks back. <laughs> <laughs> and we had an awesome dinner. Um, it was, uh, I think it was the right decision. And, and I think uh, Andrew also knew it uh, heart to heart. So Andrew um, is, uh, is a very creative guy. Uh, he was a student of music, um, which very people knew. He, do he doesn't have an MBA, he's never been to a business school. He was a student of music. Imagine student of music running a six billion dollar e-commerce venture. Uh, it doesn't happen, right? So uh, he got us to where we had to, and I think he did a good job till that. But beyond that, it was very visible that uh, things weren't happening the way it was. And uh, <clears throat> when when the decision took place, he was actually one of those. So Andrew was part of the board, and he also voted in favor of him being taken out. Um, and and I think it was. It was a good decision in, in hindsight. It, it didn't really shake the company. Um, it was business as usual. Uh, I just got to, I, I remember I got to know at about 5 in the morning. And 5.30 we had a, a management call uh, with, with all the country CEOs uh, being informed, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was it. After that, it was just back to normal. So uh, do you think you know, Groupon had this uh, 12 billion valuation earlier, where Google actually made an offer? You, you think it was wise on uh, Groupon's part to ignore that? I, I cannot comment on this. I'm, I'm too s small a piece on, no, not because of PR issues, of course not. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I know nothing about the circumstance to make a fair judgment on it. Um, <clears throat> I can definitely say that if one were to get a peek into what Groupon is thinking of for the future, um, the, the concept, not necessarily the company, 
is much, much, much bigger than the numbers that we are speaking of. So how do you, you know, how do you manage these three other countries as well? So you've got India as well, plus these three uh, countries. I mean, so, um, is that fair on your part? To <laughs> <laughs> Or, or fair on someone else's part mm -hmm. to give me that. No, I, uh, exactly, I try to yeah. be fair on my part. Yeah. No. Uh, so my my style of leadership is is uh, is very hands off. Uh, I get into details. I, I love details, but I only get into details when um, something goes bad. So uh, so if we we have because of the nature of our business, we have a weekly review. Um, the maximum that we can look out is a quarter. So I have friends uh, know, who work with companies like GE, DuPont, etc. So they say, yeah, today's presentation is 2020 vision. Wali. So that really, that 2013, you're talking about 2020 vision? Like, I, I, I don't know the vision of 2013 quarter four. Right? So, uh, uh, so it, it, it's fascinating. So we have these weekly business reviews. And the weekly business review is just a very simple determinant of business was up, business was down, etc. But what Groupon has done really well is, We've identified what really drives our business. What are the input variables? So the job of someone like myself or my peers in, in Groupon is just to see that the input variables are in place. So when I, for instance, do a review, or, and that would be true for virtually every manager, uh, we tend to focus on the output a lot. But the output has already happened. Right? So you can't really influence anything of it. You can only, uh, oh, good job, bad job, blah, 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 don't do it again. But that doesn't help. It doesn't. You have to focus on the input variables, which will determine the output the next week, or the next month, or the next year. Uh, and that's all that I measure. So if I see the number of deals being submitted is going down in a country, I know that two weeks down will be a bad week. And that's the flag. Why is it happening? What can we do to correct it? So on and so forth. And that's what, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's honestly not that, it's not that hard. Uh, I figured. I, I'd, I'd imagine it would be very hard, you know, multi-country and all that, et cetera, et cetera. But if you just stick to the fundamentals, it makes it seem easier. Right. So I'm almost out of questions. You know, this uh, uh, last question I kind of thought, um, you know, asking everyone, given the state of Indian economy, and this is what, uh, been, you know, the uh, discussion point as well in offices and with all my friends, you know, what, do you, what is one thing that, you know, we could change to make the entrepreneur scene uh, a little better in India? You know, what, one message that maybe we can give to Mr. Uh, Manmohan Singh, sir, ye kar do, I have no message for him. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even know whether he's heard me or not, right? Because he wouldn't even speak. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very heavy question, which doesn't, uh, it, it isn't, isn't required. I, I think nothing's really changed for entrepreneurs. Um, if anything, the, maybe the money flow has dried out. Um, but if you ask any VC or any investor sitting today, they are sitting on far more money than they can actually give out. So it's a dearth of ideas, not the dearth of money. That is the story of India. Um, almost every day I get people writing in, I have this new business idea, et cetera, et cetera. But none of it is really different. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fancy word, you know, it's like uh, my film is different, or ye picture hai, you know, and it ends up the same. Uh, but it's all about what is it that you're going to do different. It could be difference on execution. It could be difference on technology. It, need, it could be the same business idea, but it just has to be something different. You cannot be starting an online bookstore today. Exactly. Now, it's the stupidest idea to think of today, because there's someone else who's doing it, and perhaps doing it in a fantastic manner. So what is it that you will do different? So if you have that idea, I am sorry. But if that is what the, you know, their message or their end thing is, oh, economy is bad, and that's why I'm not able to start an online bookstore, no, that's not. That's the wrong conclusion. The so the, the thing is that government has pretty much remained the same, except yeah. that we've got more money, but the lack of ideas. I, I think that it, it's truly, it's truly lack of ideas. You know, uh, I, in the last one year, I cannot count more than five ideas that I said this is, this is it. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't. I, 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 and it needn't be. It needn't be. You know, Madhuri Dixit perfect or anything like that. It, it's just something. You know what? This has potential. This has potential. Yesterday, I, you know, I have to say this, and that's why I love meeting uh, these people. So yesterday, the, I met this guy. Uh, three of them, uh, all engineers. Uh, they've started this uh, startup called Zoptree, <clears throat> and it's a social 
job site, which almost everyone is speaking of nowadays, right from LinkedIn to Nokri to Shine.com with fancy ads, etc. But they've done it beautifully. They've just focused on the employees of the company. And it's such a brilliant idea. Every company will have job postings. Why can't they exploit the social network of their employees to get those jobs filled up through social references? And not employ any agency or anything like that. And the product is brilliant, everything is there. Now if one were to say, I want to start a job site, he will never get the money. Because there's already Nokri and LinkedIn and Monster and all those guys. But these guys, if they do it well, in two years will get acquired by these three companies. Guaranteed. Have they raised money? No. They've built the product on their own. I said the first day you are looking for money, you have to call me. Okay? Do not call anyone else. Call me. I will not put in the money. Maybe I wouldn't have enough, but I'll tell you who are the right people to go and I'll put in my little bit as a token amount or whatever it is. But ideas are the only thing that drive investments. So you know what? I'll open the house for questions. So I... Uh I ran a startup down in Brazil for a while called baby.com.br. Fantastic. And uh, one of our primary competitors is uh, a rocket company. Okay. And so I've spent years battling Oliver and uh, having something of a tense relationship uh, with our competitors. I, and I've heard people speak really, really well, right? Of the, oh, they're the best operators. And I mean, even a guy on our board was once on Groupon's board, Kevin Afrusi. Yeah. And he speaks very well of the operational skills. Right. I think the, the problem with the Samra brothers isn't necessarily their operational skills because right. they're clearly very clever. Yeah. But I think the problem is the model itself. Yes. Right? It's a turntable of people. They bring them on. Hey, here's 1% of this. Yes. And then... They, you, they put their soul into it. They stop sleeping. They stop eating. Exactly. And then six months later, they're on the chopping block and they're gone. Yes. And I think there are some ethical questions about, yes. is that really the right way to do business? Because, again, it's not their operation yes. that's the problem. It's the way that they treat people and it's how it's just very transactional. Right. And the whole idea of having a community, yeah. I mean, like this. I mean, this is a budding entrepreneurial community here. Yeah. They want nothing to do with this. No. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in having you dive in a little bit into why it is you are one of his disciples. <laughs> so I, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with two caveats and then I'll answer your question. So one is, if I were to tomorrow build a company, I would never build a rocket internet. Uh, I wouldn't, ever. Uh, it, it doesn't comply with my worldview. Uh, and I, I agree with almost all that you said. Um, the, the cultural aspect, the building a company for the long-term perspective, so on and so forth. That isn't what it is. What I like, though, um, is they have never tried to be someone else or even suggested that they were someone else. So when someone enters the rocket environment, at no point of time will the Samwar brothers sell them a story that isn't going to be true. What they would say is, it's going to mess up your life. You are going to sleep for less than two hours or whatever it is, you're going to work like an ass and you may succeed, you may not succeed. There are enough case examples and you can go online and search for all the sob stories and horror stories that have happened from Rocket. And knowing all of that, would you still or stu would not, right? And everyone who's joined in, I don't think there's ever anyone who doesn't know what the reality of Rocket is, but they still do. And I think why they do is twofold. One, the speed at which you learn things in that short period of time is unparalleled. Um, I've been in, like, uh, so I, I don't know how much you are included into uh, the, the Indian environment, but for instance, Jabong, which we were talking about. When Jabong started in India, there were at least three big players, big in all sense of the word, heavily invested, well capitalized, extremely good market value, good customer feedback, so on and so forth. And they said, screw all that. We'll still go in it, and we'll try to build it. And a year, in a year, they have done everything operationally, everything marketing-wise, everything sales-wise, everything traffic-wise to be the number one. Now, if you were in the Jabong experience ban, you would get to experience what those other companies experience in three years in just one year. You may still not like what, you, what happened to your health, what happened to your family, whatever, whatever, but you still get that exposure. 
And equipped with that exposure, you can perhaps go into any place else and be maybe, maybe an edge above the others who've had a slightly longer term perspective. That's what I, I, I like about thing. And that's not particularly, no, um, if you think about it, the, the reason why I, I admire him is no one else in the world before thought of doing something like this. The question is really that if uh, you are hiring the people smarter than you, then uh, the question is why they will work for you, first question. And second question is that uh, how, they pe how can judge the fake person? Sure. Uh, everybody is trying to put uh, yeah, on, yeah. This, uh, on this party, you know, yeah. okay, I am this and that and yeah, I can yeah. do this and that. Exactly. But the question is how be as a founder or uh, being as an entrepreneur, how you can judge yeah. The fake passion. Yeah. So my yeah. question is to fake yeah. passion. No, good. Uh, good questions. No, absolutely good questions. So, so first question is how can you actually get people smarter than you to work for you? And second is how do you judge? How do you judge fake passion, or how do you figure out real passion from not real passion? And uh, if they come, then how to retain them? How to retain them? Okay. Yeah. It's like uh, the three hardest questions in the world. <laughs> Uh, okay, first one. Um, so uh, I, I look at it slightly different from always work with people who are smarter than you. <clears throat> what I have followed is you always have to work with people who are smarter than people at their age and experience. Okay, not necessarily smarter than you. If they're smarter than you, that's fantastic. But if you only look for that, maybe you will never find someone. So if I'm looking at uh, and this is this is something that we, we do at you know, uh, Infinity as well. So we hire from Infinity. We hire from multiple other schools. We say, if we were to pick a guy who's 23 years of age, is he the smartest 23 that we have ever met? Is he smarter than how I was when I was 23? As against saying, I am 33, so can I get a guy who's 23 but still smarter than me? Then he's probably Einstein, right? Uh, and, and you'll never find that guy. So all that you're looking for is if you're hiring someone with three years of experience or hiring someone who's at a certain age, is he in the top 1% of his comparison set? And if he is, he will most likely be smarter than you when he reaches your stage. And that's it. Uh, that's all that you're looking for. So, and there are several ways of doing that. Like for instance, one, one very uh, transactional way, but I still use that because it's worked in our benefit is is this guy earning more than his peers okay how can someone earn more than his peers if he's still in a job maybe he knows someone right do you know who my father is right okay. stuff like that <laughs> uh, or he's just good more often than not we would find them extremely extremely successful extremely and he needn't be smarter than me like he could be I'm sure he is but by the time he reaches my age he'll definitely be way more smarter than me that's all I'm looking for so that's question one question two is uh, it's very hard and uh, I think uh, even I've learned it the hard way of what are those very fundamental questions that you have to ask to figure out what kind of an individual that is so there are two or three questions that at least I ask you can use them if you find them good enough uh, and I've written a blog on that as well. Uh, number one is, let's say you or your dad or your granddad or grandma, whatever it is, you had loads and loads of money. So you did not have to ever work for money. Okay, so you don't ever have to work for money. What would you do in life? Okay, and that question usually gives out very different perspectives about the person. Most people say, I'll travel, etc. And then your follow question is, can you travel all your life? And if they say yes, maybe that is passion. Because it's very hard to travel all your life. <clears throat> and very few people can do that. But if they say yes, that's great. Some people say, I'll, I'll go shopping. And I says, okay. Uh, that, that's it. <laughs> the, the, there's a sale. Because that's as short term as it gets. right? So they may say, I'm the most passionate person on earth. They say, if you give you money, what will you do? And they say, I'll go shopping. <laughs> no, that's, that's clearly not where you want to be. And there are other things, you know, uh, and it's fascinating what, what people uh, emerge with or how it is. A lot of people would say, I'll, uh, you know, and it's fascinating, I, I had this, uh, I don't remember what was the best answer, I, I should look it up, but 
uh, I remember these two or three answers, and uh, that truly told me something about the individual. One of them was. I read it on your blog. Yes. Yeah. The person uh, what did he? went to the college for the different courses. Yes, exactly. That's what he did. He said, thank you so much for that. He <laughs> said, I will enroll myself in the top courses in all the universities of the world. That's what I would do. Fascinating. That's the best answer that you can perhaps give if you had money. He doesn't have to ever earn for money. And he said, I'll go to Stanford and pick up the entrepreneurship course. I'll go to Harvard, pick up whatever. I'll go to Wharton, pick up the marketing course. I'll go to IIT, pick up this blah, blah, blah. So he clearly is someone that you know, wants to, and that's great. And the third question, uh, so that's question one. Question two that I ask is, what's the riskiest thing you've done in life? That's it, simple. What's the riskiest thing you've done in life? A lot of people will say, no, um, rafting, <laughs> uh, stuff like that. And I, th those are fine. Oh, you, you, uh, oh, that may be risky in their head. But there are a lot of people who, who then say, no, you know what, changing my job and picking this up, I thought was very risky. Uh, and I, maybe because I can relate to it, and that's why there's a connect. Uh, but that question really tells me a lot about that individual. Uh, what's the riskiest thing that you've done? And I and usually like these things, you know, challenging my boss where I found that he was asking me to do something that was not right, uh, at the risk of being maybe fired or whatever, pull off the, the role or telling a client what the truth was instead of telling him what he wanted to know, stuff like that. That also um, says thing. So these are two or three questions that you know, I, I typically uh, get. Thing. And specifically for entrepreneurship, one question that you know, I, I typically use and maybe yourself is how many unread emails do you have in your inbox? Now, I've usually found, uh, it may be a completely incorrect proxy, I've usually found people who are really anal, like everything should be perfect, they will have very few unread emails in their inbox. It's, it's like this thing that they have to keep reading the emails, even if it's about deleting them. Uh, they will still make sure that there is no unread email in their inbox. Uh, and they just tell something about the person. There are people who have like 6,000 unread emails. I don't know how can you ever get structured in that environment. Maybe they're awesome still with that. So you have to figure out those, those questions that relate to you and your business. Retention is a completely different story. I wouldn't even go there. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Sometimes, don't you think intuition also plays a part? No, see, see, because if you work too, too, too much to the one percent, one percent, there are some people who just like, oh, listen, yeah, for me, money is life, life, and everything is like, I can buy anything, I can buy everyone. I'm exactly. like, yeah, sure, good yeah. for you, I'm happy for you, but I can't. Thanks. Exactly. Yes. But you know. No, absolutely. And, and, and I think as, a, as an entrepreneur, your intuition should be your favorite friend or your best friend. Uh, I would never give up on that. Um, sorry, please. So I, I think what I was referring to is you have to, of course, get to a certain benchmark for you to even get into these questions. right? And, and that connect has to happen much before. Now, I am privileged where I sit today because most people who come to interview with me have already passed through multiple filters of my colleagues, my people in the company, HR, blah, blah, blah. And we've all defined what are the things that we're looking for. And most of them are non-transactional. Most of them are elements of culture fit. Most of them are uh, things like, has he, been in a, has he worked in an environment where he was supposed to call sir and ma'am to his seniors? Uh, has he worked in environments where he had to come to work every day even though he was not required to come to work every day? Now, what, what, is the, what is the kind of worldview that he comes from? Now, has, what kind of colleges has he gone to? What kind of uh, performance has happened there? Uh, ha, does he have some spark in him? Uh, is, is there something different? Inside? And I know that I, I distinctly remember I've hired people. So one, anyone who, like that who comes up uh, has already passed through this. And there are a lot of these interview feedback that we get. He's like, I can't pinpoint, but there is something about him. And, and there is a lot of these instances that come to me. And I would also conclude with the same remark. And we would say, let's go ahead. The, the f risk of failure is too small than the risk of not trying him out. Let's do it. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's worked out in several instances. But you will, and uh, as you would imagine, if you're trying to build a really big company, uh, you will perhaps come to a point where it has to be a little more transactional because it's just voluminous, et cetera. But for the first few hires, what you're saying cannot cannot be undervalued. Hi, I'm Nitish, actually. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, like your uh, first startup was uh, secondsali.com, right? Yes. So 
uh, in india second sa- uh, shaadi is a uh, kind of crime word yes yes so what kind of uh, uh, marketing problem you has you are facing at that time yeah Yeah. That's it. I'm, I'm glad you asked this question. So what what happened? Exactly the same thoughts had come to our mind that second shadi as a concept is uh, or, or second marriage or remarriages is is you no know, somewhat of a taboo. People don't sp- speak about it easily. You definitely don't have pundits carrying kundlis of people who are you not know, divorces or we don't. Know, right. So what was amazing is the day we launched and uh, people started getting to know about it. The media. labeled us as reformers right so so we became these crusaders out there to change the the society and everything so second shaadi has got more press coverage positive press coverage than any other business except for groupon but that's no because it's a large company than any other business even though they were far more successful businesses than second shaadi financially or anything otherwise you know there's oh there's this new concept and now divorces and widowed people finally have a way to find their partners this is no this is just exactly what india needed no so they i remember i started getting calls from people who is like what do you think is the divorce rate in india it's like we you know we are not divorce experts right <laughs> like right? no, can you comment on uh, do you think that call centers is a big reason why divorces are happening in india <laughs> So I I can't even connect. No, no, they're working late at night, but the wife is working in the morning, so they don't even meet, and etc. So no, I, I, no, I'm not even married. So why are you asking me these questions? So, um, so surprisingly, and uh, no, it was not by design. Almost all the marketing that happened for Second Shadi was very positive from a PR perspective, very positive. And I think that was because um, it was a it was the first time something like this had happened. that 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 was that was it because even shaadi.com or bharat matrimony and all the other sites they never really spoke about this section of marriages openly or discussed it so it helped us but it wasn't something that we could have ever comprehended have you faced any problem there no 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 there wasn't uh, thankfully not like it it came to a point where people said uh, do you have a counselor on board But can you offer counseling services? Because I'm not sure of. Well, I, I'm still over to get for my first marriage, so I want to make sure I'm ready for my second marriage. That so, no, there were a lot of demands from people who were like 26 years of age. So we couldn't even disclose our ages uh, to to people that you know, we we're not even married the first time. So uh, <laughs> forget that. But uh, thankfully, no problems. Thankfully, not. So yeah, so now you've been with Groupon now a couple of years, 2011, yes, 2013. Yes, two, uh, yes, two and a half years now. So yes. what's next on your roadmap now? Ah, uh, uh, I have I have a f- few personal goals to achieve at Groupon, um, and after that, I I honestly don't know, and that's the story of my life. I I don't know what I'll be doing next. I just know that whatever it is, uh, it will be in the internet space. That's something that really comes naturally to me. I love this media. I love what it can do. Uh, I'm also. <laughs> beginning to become really fascinated about the mobile space in specific uh, not necessarily mobile and internet but pure mobile businesses by itself and i think the way most of us are now consuming the mobile phone is just absolutely fascinating it just makes me wonder where the next business idea is it's it's for sure that the next big idea is coming on the mobile phone it's it's it will not be the internet anymore um i see myself there but what specifically in that no idea absolutely so, not so, so good follow up question on that sure. now groupon is at the at the cross section of uh, or rather intersection of uh, e-commerce and advertising yes. right two of the biggest buzzwords in the world yes market. what do you think of both of these spaces um, what do you think is going to power the next uh, you know version of uh, of scale is it e-commerce is it advertising uh within the context of mobile or internet within india yeah we of course have a lot of data on what's happening in the us yep. and and abroad yep. but but within indian context yep. what do you think is really going to you know i think uh it? two trends will definitely emerge one uh mobile commerce will definitely pick up uh, has to uh, has to but what will also happen is advertising from again a mobile perspective will see or or advertising will see a comeback because of mobile So the biggest challenge that advertising led businesses uh, in India faced were they were still very disconnected from the normal life of the consumer. So Yahoo was all about coming to yahoo.com, consuming the media, doing that etc. But now we all know that our consumption of media is more and more on the go. 
It is not sitting in front of a computer and you know, making time for it, etc. It's on the move. It's about Google Maps, it's about Zomato, it's about Book My Show, it's about instant redemption, whatever it is. And because of that, content will see a resurgence, definitely. So if you are, and that kind of sums up with, with the mobile thing itself. So uh, I think digital will see a massive, massive push towards mobile. And WhatsApp, to a great extent, has, has proven that. You know, they are, I, I read this, and it was fascinating and shocking at the same time. India is the only country for Facebook where it has a majority of its users who have accessed Facebook only on mobile and have never ever accessed it on the web, ever. They only have accessed Facebook on the mobile phone. And that's fascinating. It, it's just mind boggling how that has happened. And it is amazing how things like fa you know, WhatsApp and, and Facebook and, and not so much Twitter, but at least these two have penetrated the Indian market, especially on the phone. Um, uh, I can't find, I don't, it's, it's crazy how many people are there on WhatsApp without it needing a Pariniti Chopra or <laughs> anyone to, to be marketed, right? Um, and the, the head of business for WhatsApp is an ISBN from my batch. Right? He's, he's, he's a multimillionaire, of course, on paper, and you know, he's in the thick of things. So I, I keep going back to him every day. I was like, you, you, know, you have so much information about how the world is changing. Oh, you, you're literally that uh, future scientist, if you will, and it's like, yeah, it's just fascinating what all people are doing. Yeah, but it seems like it, no? absolutely. Hi, sorry for using the platform like a Q&A of a newspaper, but I'd actually want to go about defining a situation that I'm currently in, sure. and I'd like to probably seek your advice on it. Uh, I was working with a good FMCG company in the marketing department, drawing good salary, everything was okay. Uh, till about six months ago when I started getting bored with the brand that I was working upon. And uh, although it was one of the most fun brands and a fun category, confectionery and doing a lot of stuff, but then despite that, I just, we picked up social media, I started working on digital, started display advertising, everything, thinking that that might change my mind. Because that will be those will be new, uh, new th that will be new age media. It will be different kind of thinking that will entail. But despite that, I was getting bored. And then I decided that I actually had a research background, consumer research background, and I went on a sabbatical and took up some projects for Microsoft Seattle and British Airways, and I was super happy working on those projects. And now I have decided to quit. I've actually put in my papers, and I'm starting my own consumer research firm. Awesome. Now. Um, Although I've made that decision, so there is no going back on it, but my question is that um, on one hand, I feel that uh, because I don't have any funds to start this company, so I don't want to invest in terms of managing an office space or hiring people. So my thought is that maybe I could start gathering projects that I can and probably start building capital, take home only my salary the way it was earlier, and then reinvest that into creating an office space and hiring people. Right. My other thought is that, am I capable of working from home? You know, so whether it is a good decision to invest in the beginning or whether I should wait for my business to reach a point where I should start reinvesting back into the business. Right. So, um, so uh, I think I'll answer the, the question simply from a bootstrapping perspective. Uh, that there is raising funds is a very fashionable thing to do um, and there are some businesses that cannot do without it so if you're looking at retail businesses like for instance can could flipkart have reached where it is today without funds the answer is absolutely no but could some other companies have reached where they are without funds the answer is yes um, there are a lot of businesses that don't require the funds but a lot of founders get into this fashionable thing or oh, XYZ company has raised X million from funds and oh, now is in the radar of future investments also. It's a lot, lot, lot of pressure, honestly. Um, wherever you can, this is my limited guidance, but I would love to know more to give you some, some better ones, is um, wherever you can, do it your own way. Um, an office space is not mandatory for running your business. Uh, a computer is. 
Right? So, so if you have to invest that in getting a better computer than what you have today, then getting a better office space. Um, people are perhaps more important for your business than anything else. But <clears throat> can that come at the expense of not having a good sales guy? Maybe not. Right? So, because eventually that project will pay for whatever it is. So think of what are these, these levers. No? So, um, there are these enough, if you go to the, the, the Silicon Valley you know, and you hear these presentations of people like me would be, not like me, uh, much better than me sitting here. So they will always say, you give yourself plus one for every engineer you have and minus 10 for every MBA you have. And, and that's the way they think because theirs is a fundamental product driven business. Everything is about engineers. But if you were to look at a consumer research company or if you were to look at a media agency that you were to build, etc., then you would say give yourself plus one for every sales guy that you have and maybe minus 10 for every you know, strategy role that you, know, you, you have or, or the office space that you're planning to build or anything like that. Bootstrap to whatever extent possible and don't be ashamed of doing it. You will, you will be maybe for a, a short period of time uh, feeling that where am I, my, my friends are earning better, they can afford a lot more, etc. But that's where Groupon comes in. Uh, <laughs> no? and, and, and more importantly, uh, you will know that what you're doing is right. No? So don't, don't ever give up on that. The minute you feel that your faith in it is dwindling, largely because of the business, not because of yourself, uh, that's when maybe you have to think twice. Uh, so, but don't, don't be ashamed of living a absolutely down to the basics life as, as a startup guy. You need to define where you want to be. Set yourself goals. The goal cannot be I'll get acquired. The goal cannot be I'll list at whatever, whatever. The goal is in six months, I need 50 paying clients. In X months, I'll need that. And figure out how much do you really need to get to that and wh whether you have it or not. And if you don't, do you revise the goal or do you lower down your spending or whatever it is that you can do? And that's the way you have to think about it. So if you say, in six months, I want to get into 50 playing clients and they will give me this much, but this is the money that I need. I don't have that money. So maybe you say, okay, my goal is actually four months and not six, or I will not go for the office space that I was thinking of. I'll work from home, but I'll still get to that six X paying clients. Whatever it is. Yeah, so as we, the students of Infinite Business School, we know that you know you're a brilliant teacher, and I'm glad when it that. comes to you know <laughs> when it comes to making a study, when it comes to the way you teach, it's like amazing, and the course you take, it's like digital marketing, it's totally amazing. So, my question to you is, how do you actually fit in the teaching part with it, with the entrepreneurship? You know, how, how do you manage it? How do you fit in with with the entrepreneur? <laughs> It's because I teach digital marketing and not human resources, right? So <laughs> this is what I do for a living, right? So it, I, I don't have to prepare for the class. No, if, if, if Surbhi or Nitin were to suggest that I take up a, a class of uh, something that I'm you know, not doing, then uh, I'll either not be good at it or it'll just be such pain to prepare for it. But digital marketing, all the things that it is, it makes me better. So I, I know, for instance, the the virality course that we had. I remember the, so I've been teaching this for three years now. The first year was all about Facebook and that's what we spoke about virality. Last year it was about YouTube and viral videos and this year it was about WhatsApp. And every year it's changing, you know? it's, it's not the same content, it's not that, but I'm learning through that uh, and, uh, and, and that's what it is. But it's because I do this for a living, you know? this is what comes. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I, and I'm blessed again that I, uh, I, th I think I can, speak in front of a crowd and make myself uh, understandable and uh, that's what I, I use. Can, can you attend that course? <laughs> <laughs> She's the lady you have to... It is, it is on for sale. <laughs> yeah, I know. We'll run a group on deal on that. Hi, uh, Hi. my name is Ayush. I just wanted to know what were the biggest uh, problems which you faced with Gaudi? Ah, uh, uh, several, man. It was I, I think it was the hardest business that I've been in, harder than Groupon as well. Uh, the biggest difference was the realization. Or, or I, no, let, let me answer it differently. I, I think our biggest mistake was to think that the business would happen in a way that was different from the normal world. 
So here's the thing about India, and that's what it makes it harder. All of us keep hearing about India as an unorganized market, India is this unorganized retail, etc., etc. How many of you really hate that unorganized retail market? Do you have a problem with that? No, we don't have a problem with that. It is super efficient, whatever unorganized behavior India shows or displays. You want to sell your used car, you don't have to go to any website to list it, anything like that. You just go to the local car dealer. In two hours, he'll give you the price that you want. Or will tell you, boss, this price will not be And will give you the best price. Or if you want to buy a car, go in there. Even if he doesn't have it, in two hours, he'll give you the car at the price that you want. You want to buy something, there are streets and streets around it. Is Flipkart the best store to buy books or mobile phone? No. The shop down the road is, etc. So when we built of Gadi, we were like these, you know, from the second Shadi Crusaders mode. We were like, we will transform this used car market and we will completely change it the way it is. It is, why should people have to uh, go to a car dealer to buy their, or to sell their car? We will bring it all online, etc. And that was the biggest mistake. Because what we realized is, this unorganized market works beautifully. We are trying to make something organized when actually making or doing so will make it inefficient, not efficient, unlike the US. Because in the US, retail is not spread out or does not have the kind of density that it does. And Walmart will always be off the city or your biggest store. So all that you have is 7-Eleven, but that will only store three variants of the ice cream that you want, while Walmart will have 10,000 or whatever it is. So the reason, you have to drive there, it's inconvenience. But if the same stuff is available in India, it is. So that was the biggest biggest learning. And it was very hard uh, to figure that out. Because we went to used car dealers and said, they said, we don't need you. I don't see any value that you can add to us. I said, OK, uh, oops. So we just built this website. And <laughs> now, now, now we don't know what to do with it. So um, and then we turned around. And we said, OK, forget all this. Let's make it into pure advertising. And let's focus on new cars. So, Maruti launches a car every day, and you know, they have this massive budget, et cetera, et cetera. But where are they getting the most fundamental things that they want, which is test drives? Because test drives is the fundamental marketing metric for any car company. Sales is the output of it. But test drives is the fundamental thing. How many people are getting a test drive? So he said, we'll facilitate test drives. We'll say, hey, you launched a car. You click on the banner. You'll come to a nice form. You'll fill up the form. And then someone from Harati will call you, arrange for a test drive, all that. Um, and that's where we had another realization. When you, when you make it so open, everyone started asking for a test drive. Yeah. And because now it was super simple. You don't have to go to the car dealer to get a test drive. You can literally sit there and say, test drive, and tomorrow a night. So, so people who had, you know, and I shouldn't say that, but that was a reality. People who had income levels of three to four lakhs were test driving BMWs and Mercedes you know, and all those stuff. And we weren't sending the income information because that was private information. So the, the deal, dealers didn't know better. So they used to say, sir, sir, ye Mangolpuri mein BMW. <laughs> you know, do you think this will sell? Oh, sir, lead, I know. Someone's filled up that form, so I, I, I don't know. And that's where we had to revisit the model, revisit the model, revisit the model continuously. Um, and that was a big, big learning experience, which is why the time we took from the second website, which is Gadi, to our third, which is Study Nation, was the longest in the period I sent you. Because we just figured, hey, you know what? We thought it was simple, but it just isn't at all. Uh, so we have to get this right before we even move to the third one. Um, and Eventually, we, f we figured what was the, the blended route of doing it, and what are the qualifiers, the checks and balances, what you do, et cetera. What is the main driver of, of getting it done, uh, so on and so forth. So to just give you an instance of how we solve the test drive problem is, we removed the book a test drive section completely. And we translated that into get on-road pricing. So we said, when is it that you actually want on-road pricing? There is an ex-showroom price, but there is an on-road price which is inclusive of insurance, registration, octroid, tracks, blah, blah, blah. Only people who are actually serious of buying that car. You may check what the on-road price of a BMW is, but what is the likelihood that you can't afford it, but you would still check? Very less. But would you check a Maruti Swift and an Alto or something like that? Of course you would. And we started using that as a proxy 
for booking test drives. So, we said on road price and then we asked the question would you like a test drive and that is when they were also the TKF now it is there. We still had those incidences of people doing it, but they were far reduced. These were the two biggest examples. One completely misunderstanding what the market or what we were trying to solve and, and two also not understanding the consumer. Okay, so, were you at any time you know thinking about lead conversion rather than generation? So, we went to that route, but what happened is what we realized is uh, that was a lucrative business for us in a, in a very um, <clears throat> non-intuitive manner. It was lucrative only for brands that were actually not selling. So, brands that were not selling were the ones who were willing to pay us on a conversion model because they knew that if they got the leads, they would not as it is be able to convert the guy. So, it says our cars are not selling and we cannot do anything about it. Let them sell it and we will pay them the money directly. So, it was non-intuitive because we were now telling trying to sell cars that as it is were not selling in the market. Um, so, we stopped that business. So, you know what is the story behind you being uh, related to Shami Kapoor's family? Shab no, no I am not related to Shami Kapoor's family. <laughs> I don't know, there was a point of time when a lot of people started saying you look like Shami Kapoor <laughs> and I don't know what wave that was. So, I think it was the overweight wave <laughs> and uh, it came to a point wherein I was traveling to Bombay in um, taking the taking the Rajdhani and I was uh, getting off CST I think which was last stop. And uh, there was this guy opposite who came in and was like, yeah, to hero hai, Shammu Kapoor and all that stuff. <laughs> like, what? No, people in Delhi were talking about this and now Bombay guys, yes, but that was just a frivolous uh, incident. It was a period of one month where somehow something had happened. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have a very specific issue that I am facing. Uh, I have a very unconventional background as in, I have done uh, graduation in philosophy and then I did an MBA and uh, then I was working in this telecom company as a product innovations person. So, you know kind of things which do not go <laughs> together. No. Uh, after working there for <coughs> two and a half years, you know you start getting that entrepreneurial bug that you know maybe if I do things my own way, you know they could be launched faster and something would be my own kind of. Now, uh, I have got few ideas, but what I am trying to, uh, I am facing difficulty in is finding tech guys, you know, people who could actually convert those ideas into businesses. So, what would be your suggestion? I mean, how is the way I should approach it? Okay, great. Um, I think that is that's a problem that almost all of us face at some point of time. I would as well, right, because I am not a tech guy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that makes it the three of us at least. So, the way you have to think about it, the two questions that you have to answer. One is, is tech a core product slash business feature? So, if you are trying to build a Facebook and you are not a techie guy, sorry, right, because that cannot happen. But if you are trying to build a, a normal business, say Gadi.com, uh, the website is only the interface, but the actual action happens on the streets for the, or, or for that matter, say Nokri or whatever it is. So, that is one. And if you do figure that tech is something that is core to your business, then the only way for you to do it is to get a co-founder or to <coughs> learn it yourself. There is no other way. There is absolutely no other way. You have to get someone who is as passionate about that business as you are and that person is either you or someone else that you know who could be. What yeah. would be the way to find that co-founder? Oh, that is a hard <laughs> question. I thought I could get away with this. Uh, so, finding a tech co-founder um, is is hard. Um, there are there are two or three opportunities or whatever avenues to do this. Of course, forums like these don't miss them, and I'm guessing you're already doing it, which is why you're here as well. Uh, and the other is don't or and this is in general, don't ever be limited by having a completely wild idea and going there. So I'll <clears throat> I'll tell you one instance. I had this idea which I haven't been able to do, but I had this idea which was a complete tech idea. And I was really passionate about it and I think I, I wanted to do it. So, I went to IIT Delhi and I posted that offering. I said, I am looking for computer science guys, students who can work with me for three months. I will pay them whatever is it that they would get in any other you know, 
consulting role, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the money that I was able to commit. But I'll, I'll work with you and see whether I can get to a prototype that gives me the confidence. And once I get to that prototype, then I can either engage an agency to do it, or it'll be easier for me to find a co-founder who can build on this prototype because he can actually see it in action, rather than a non-techie trying to explain to a techie that this is a product I want to build. <laughs> like, yeah, come on, right? So that doesn't work. Um, so don't hesitate from making these leaps. And you may think, you know, student of philosophy, and I said, no, why would IIT Delhi you know, do that? But there are enough people out there, and super smart guys, who want to get things done. And maybe they just need this one more hand to join, said, okay, let's do it. Let's, let's just go ahead and build it, because I would be wasting my summer internship in some European school working under a professor, or working my ass off in Goldman Sachs, which has nothing to do with what I'm doing right now. And maybe this will be better. Please. Hi, sir. Uh, I need your advice, basically. Um, my idea is on a raw, raw stage, so I'm planning to start something. So I just would like to know uh, that is there a need to register a web, uh, web startup? Um, if you, are you the only one? Yes, I'm the only one. Then maybe not. Um, but if you have a co-founder, it's always good to have a complete structure which is legal in place as well. And it's very easy to start a company in India. Uh, you know, unlike what some of you may believe. Uh, it takes virtually two weeks to start a company in India and that's, it's all online. So uh, that shouldn't be, and that should be the last of your worries uh, in the sense. But to answer your question, if you are by yourself, you don't have to do it right now. It's only required when you get into a formal funding environment or if you have another partner coming in, so that the split and the partnership is very well quantified. But till such time, not required. Uh, but actually sir, I would like to be a uh, very on a safe safe side. Basically, if I register a firm, basically, so if someone would like to sue me, because it's a portal like that, if someone would like to sue me, so that I can be on a very safe side, that it's not on me, <laughs> it's on a, on, on firm. Uh, if, 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 if it's that risky, then maybe yes, you should. I you should. should. A private limited company. I don't know what you're starting, but no, <laughs> it looks interesting. What I'm thinking of, it should not be like that, it's on me. You're <laughs> not nothing like that, sir. Sting videos. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not going on that side. Okay, okay. No, yeah, if, if there is any, uh, that, that's a fair point. If there is any scope of a liability or any legal complication, it's good to have a private limited so that your liability is limited. So actually what happened if there is, a, uh, there is not any renowned company, so anyone would like to uh, see, you, see you that uh, you, you did the wrong thing or whatever. whatever no, and, and that's fine. Uh, if you have that worry, then uh, yeah. yeah. And it's not, a, it's not a big thing, so you can do it right away. Thank Absolutely. you, sir. Hi. Hello. Yeah. yeah. My question is uh, related to second shadi. Yeah. So when you were building it and thinking about scaling it really, yeah. Uh, you you've been really uh, vis uh, wishing to uh, break first shadi to build the second shadi. I mean, people <laughs> to come out for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We 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 used to invite ourselves to marriages and say. Eh. We, we have a better plan. <laughs> no, not really. That wasn't, that wasn't the idea. I'm, I'm glad you were not a reporter. <laughs> um, no, uh, our, we, we were very, con and, uh, no, uh, actually, to, to, be, to be very serious, that was a thought that always used to cross our mind. What if people say you are actually encouraging people, not encouraging, but at least saying that, you know what, it, it's now okay for you to get divorced because now you have second shadi. But that was giving our, ourselves more importance than we actually deserved because it wasn't as if now people said, you know what, I don't need you anymore, I have second uh, That That really didn't happen as much as we would like to believe. Uh, and at no point of time did we even project ourselves to the media like that. We were very, very conscious and cautious of that. So it was all about, People who are already divorced, already widowed, and have no avenue to find a partner if they wish to get married again, this is the platform. Okay, one more question. Please. So, uh, when people, uh, for now, people have a platform for second Shadi, right? Yeah. So, till then, for now, have a, there's a platform. Yeah. So, people in the first Shadi may be looking for the future one yeah. to break the second, first one. And there were cases like that. They were, they were actually, um, there were actually people who were in the middle of their divorce on second shadi. 
uh, and of course by law you you cannot be married to get married again uh, in India at least uh, if you if you are in specific religions so <clears throat> We did have, as is, you know, Facebook has, right? Are you single or in a relationship, etc.? So we did have those as well. And in our capacity, all that we could say is, when you're interacting with someone, make sure that you are absolutely sure of their credentials. Verify that to whatever extent you can before you make the leap. And from you know, your perspective as well, uh, because we were a company, uh, you now we had also absorbed ourselves from all such liabilities that. Someone would say, you know, I, I married this guy and he was already married. Um, so we were not liable for that. When you are an entrepreneur, but how do you safeguard, you know, your idea being taken? No, I, I, I may be the wrong, I may be the wrong person to answer that because that's, that's also something that Rocket has also told me or, or made me aware that uh, perhaps idea is the least important thing in the entire scheme of things. So it's, it's all about getting that idea to, to reality uh, than, than anything else. In very few cases, and they may be. So I, I am, and that's just me, I am very dismissive of people who would say, I have an idea to share, but you'll have to sign an NDA. So as like, uh, sorry, if you have an NDA, then I have uh, someone else to talk to. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I would never. If, if an entrepreneur thinks that their idea is so awesome that they cannot share it with anyone, then uh, most likely they're thinking the wrong way. Uh, it has to be about what they do eventually with it. Can can I respond to that? Please. So uh, I've started two venture back businesses, and uh, my current one's in San Francisco, and uh, we just closed 1.2 million just a couple months ago. Congratulations. And uh, my previous one was in Brazil. I just referenced earlier. And um, this like people who have not started a business before, I that's like this is one of the biggest yes. first questions. Like, but. What if somebody steals my idea, right? <laughs> and uh, first off, that's so natural and normal to feel that. And if you're feeling that, welcome to the club. Uh, I think the best way to prevent somebody from stealing your idea is to, beel, to build walls. Um, I remember I was really interested in the payment space one time, and uh, no one was really in it. I'd heard about uh, the company that became Square, but this is before they'd even publicly launched. Right. So it's like, you know, right in the beginnings of kind of the resurgence of the payment space. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, I want to build a robust and flexible money collaboration tool. That's what I called it. And, uh, and then I, I was reading a TechCrunch article. And uh, this company was building a product very similar to mine, right? And they had Max Levchin yeah. as an advisor. <laughs> so it's like, for me, what did I do? I sunk in my chair and I was like, Great. That's I don't want to do it anymore, right? Yeah. Because they built a wall. Yeah. They said, well, you know what? We're staking a claim. And we got Max effing Levchin <laughs> to advise us. That's a wall. So had they even launched it? Yeah. Barely. You know, they had a really early semblance of a product. So you could say, oh, anybody could go build the same thing. And likely, maybe you could. But you're not going to get Max Levchin. Yeah. So I think in the idea is now that's a big coup, right? Young startup getting Max Levchin, that's a big deal. Um, but there's lots of ways to build walls that when somebody hears about it, it's like, oh, geez, can I do that? I don't know. Maybe we should go back to the drawing board. So you really just want to start when you're really young. You're really only competing against even younger companies, right? So it doesn't matter if some bigger company does it, right? We, we can't compete against that. But against other entrepreneurs, other people that are thinking, ah, oh, maybe they're scoping for an idea, just try and find a, a wall that you can build that makes it, someone else feel like, Maybe not worth going in that area. It looks like they've kind of got something going. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Thank you. That, I think that's a fantastic response. If you, are an, uh, if you have an idea, but uh, I have a little bit of experience about it, and uh, you are going to someone and say, uh, we have this idea, and you are fear, fear that uh, someone will build uh, better than me. If you are have a fear that someone will better than you, they, I think you stop, uh, you stop this idea. Because there is no way to doing because the idea is I think the role is not a big because the building team or uh, there are a lot of things look the market it, everybody is having a different thought different process different things so it doesn't matter to go in anywhere or it, you tell the idea because it's all about the person right. idea is nothing until or unless if execution is not there execution team building market there are a lot of things you require idea's role is only I think is a 
maybe is a 10% or 15%. Yeah. The rest of them is the execution is required. So no one will copy the idea. Yeah. What I realize. No, I I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that. Please. Uh, just to follow up to this because this is a, what my B school professor had shared. Uh, it's I mean obviously the guy now involved is Steve Jobs, so it's it's but I'm but I'm just trying to draw a parallel. Uh, this guy, uh, my B school professor, has invested in about 70, 80 businesses and has about 10, 15 good exits. So he's done pretty well for himself. Guy in his late 50s, maybe mid 50s, and I've graduated with three, four years back. So he goes uh, to Steve Jobs and versus Larry and Serge, um, right. uh, Larry Page and Sergey yeah. Brin. So when he went to Steve Jobs, Steve was, Jobs was like, he was dismissive. You know what? What the hell? I'll just copy your idea. And he was like, damn aggressive. And <laughs> he's like, when I looked at Steve Jobs, I was like, my goodness, <laughs> My jaw dropped. I was like, well, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. But then he said, when I went to Larry Page and Sergey Brin, these guys were like nice guys. I mean, yeah. they, you know, not the, you know, the shark mentality. I've got to eat this guy up. Right. So my point is that, okay, now the guy may not be a Steve Jobs in front of you. One sure. and maybe a million people get that chance. But if there's a guy, you, when you think about sharing your idea, this is why he said I became very selective about sharing ideas after that. Right. Maybe not a Steve Jobs, but there's a guy who can replicate my idea. I'm looking for him for advice, maybe to collaborate, but that guy says, no, I'm not giving you advice, I'm not collaborating, I'm just giving you a kick in your butt, and out you go. <laughs> I'm yeah. just copying it. So right. sometimes that, that is a real idea and it's happened. No, and, and it's happened several times. We, yes, yes, there's, there's documented proof of it happening several times. Yes, uh, then what is a guy doing? I, there, there isn't any way out. I, I think this is, this is a great way of thinking about it, that what is the wall that you can build? The wall could be money, the wall could be just power, the wall could be people who are advising you or mentoring you, the, the wall could be something else. Technology, most like most startups here have technology as walls, uh, whatever it is, and maybe you are in a position where you don't have any wall, uh, and maybe that's when you say, you know what, I'm going to be extremely secret about it and only share it to people who care, or whatever it is, and that's your call. Um, but don't the 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 way I always think about it is 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 the following. Um, I know for a fact that I'm not smarter than the average world. So what is the likelihood that I would think of an idea and no one else has? Zero. Zero. The likelihood of that happening is zero. Especially in today's socially connected world, the likelihood that I have an idea that no one else has is zero. So there are several people at the same time who have that idea. But what differentiates them from me or me from them is that someone is gone ahead with it. And that's what happened. None of the businesses that you've seen that have launched and have become extremely successful, right from an Instagram to a Square to a Facebook to a WhatsApp, whatever, were new or were completely disruptive. The only one that I can perhaps think of is the iPhone in the recent past, but nothing else or very few of them would have completely disruptive ideas that no one else had thought of. And if that's the case, you may be giving yourself way too much importance than um, you could, but that would still be the case. And in that case, you g go with your gut. You don't want to share, don't. But don't think that that would safeguard you. My question was also related to something like if you have a technological idea, you can patent it. So yeah. Some, some, so are these those ideas in India? Yeah. Something that you can. Yeah. See, t technology patents is as it is a very disputed area. Um, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, you you can you can have patents for. For physical things, but how can you you, you patent technology? Yeah, exactly. No swipe and round curves, <laughs> but uh, the best question in the world. Yeah. Please, yes. Yeah, at one point of time, there was a large number of daily deal businesses in India. Yes. And most of them have e either moved into different model, of, like Snapdeal, now completely into e-retail. Yeah. So, what's your take on the profitability of this daily deal business? So I, I I'm biased, but uh, it's. Um, it, it's fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. I think the reason why most daily deal sites died in India is because they did not think of the business the way we think of it. Um, this business is all about merchants. It's not about customers. Sorry to break your heart, but it's not. Um, it's about merchants getting customers. And you have to solve the business problem of the merchant, not the customer. Now, what happened is <clears throat> all the other versions of daily deals, and you know, we have to somewhat thank uh, Snapdeal for that. Uh, Kunal, Kunal's a good friend. Uh, I, I met him last week as well, and each time I meet him, I always tell him, oh, you, you, you screwed up. Oh, you, you, you did. And he said, no, 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 this was by choice. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Uh, but the entire mechanism of having a token price, which is pay 49, pay 99, and pay the rest to the merchant, is absolutely harmful for the merchant. Because the kind of people who will walk in and the kind of 
expectation they would have, etc., is very different from people who are coming in paying the full price model, where they would have paid the entire triple line, etc., and the entire technology that is given to the merchants, etc. Um, to answer your question, think about it this way. How many of us would buy a mobile phone every month? No one, maybe some. Uh, how many of us would buy a book every month? Maybe yes. How many of us would buy a Bluetooth device every, every month? No. How many of us would buy a shoe every month? No. How many of us would buy a jeans or a t-shirt or a shirt every month? Maybe, maybe yes. Now, how many of us would go out to eat every day or every week or every month? A lot of us. How many of us would go and get a health package every month? Maybe. How many of us would want to go for a spa or a massage every month? Yes. How many of us would like to travel out for a weekend destination for two or three days? Yes. So, as I'd mentioned before, the reason why it's small right now is because you're building this category. This concept did not exist. This concept in the US today is in four years worth three billion dollars. To set things in context, Amazon, an 11 year old company is 50 billion dollars. Last year, this sorry, last quarter, quarter two of 2013, Groupon had seven and a half million downloads of the mobile app across the globe. Amazon, in comparison, had 5 million downloads in quarter two. And that is the largest e-commerce company that we know of in the world. So when you think of this, and when you think of the market that you're sitting on, you think this is a trillion dollar market. You're not thinking billions anymore. And it's for us to win, or for us to lose. Will Groupon be the number one player in this market? No one knows. But will this market continue to exist and only become bigger and bigger and bigger? Decisively, yes. And eventually, profitable as well. We're already profitable globally, but when you think of markets or you know, pieces like India, etc., it's investment mode. We'll get there. Okay. Perfect. I think it's time to wrap up. Thanks a lot. Thank you to uh, Rachin for again helping us out with the recording. He's Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks to Infinity. Thank you.